Good afternoon. It's very nice to see you all here. Before we begin, may I acknowledge on behalf of us all the Aboriginal owners of this land on which the university is based and pay our respects and to their elders and their traditions, past, present and emerging. My name is David Goodman. I'm the director of the China Studies Centre here at the University uh, of Sydney. And uh, we're holding today this um, uh, round table. And I'd like to introduce to you the uh, people who will be speaking. Uh, Glenda Corporal from uh, The Australian will be the chair and moderator. She will be well known to you as one of our country's uh, leading journalists on China's uh, development over the last few years. Uh, next to her is James Lawrenson, the director of the Australia-China Research Institute at the University of Technology, Sydney, across the road from here. In the middle is Jocelyn Che, who's very famous, of course, of having taught some of you Chinese many years ago at this university, who then went on to uh, work with DFAT and is now a visiting professor at the University of Sydney. And finally, on the end of the row is uh, Kevin Hopgood-Brown, who is, uh, has been for many years, for many decades, uh, a leading figure in economic relations between China and Australia. Over now to you, Glenda, to ask the questions and to get on with the uh, discussion. Thank you. Thanks, David, and thanks very much for coming and, and being here on person, particularly on a, on a Friday um, when a lot of people um, perhaps like to be at home, but I think it shows your commitment that you've turned up. I mean, this is, a, this is actually a very, very important subject for, for Australia and for our, for our future and our role in the region. Um, it's been a, an amazing two weeks um, in, in, in Australia. I mean, we've had a change of government. Uh, we've had the new Prime Minister, uh, Anthony Albanese, jump on a plane and immediately go to Japan, meet up with President Biden and uh, Modi and the Japanese Prime Minister. Um, and then we've had Penny Wong make two separate trips to the Pacific. Uh, and then we've got this sort of weird diplomacy where Wang Yi, the Chinese foreign minister, is, is sort of island hopping in the Pacific and Penny Wong is, is going back and forward in the Pacific. And, um, and she's also, there also was a possibility of uh, Pacific Islands um, signing a security and economic pact with China and that seems to have um, uh, not happened as yet. So suddenly in the last two weeks, foreign affairs is right uh, right on the front page of Australian newspapers and the media and also um, this government, I think, after a government that hasn't been that interested in the region is signalling they're taking the region very, very seriously. Um, two weeks ago, uh, some of us involved with, with a chapter um, doing a book on China, 50 years of Australia-China relations, met here just before the election. And um, there was sort of this uh, feeling of anticipation of change and, and maybe you know some hope of an improvement in the relationship. But the, the tone uh, seems to be a bit different in the past two weeks than what I might, uh, might have expected with Albanese. Um, saying Australia hasn't changed, China has changed. Um, we've got prospect of Penny Wong, major changes in the public service. Interesting to see what happens at DFAT. We've got um, Cheng Lei still in jail in China and her former uh, partner was on Sky News, Nick Coyle, who some of us knew when we were in Beijing. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to start, I'm going to, we've got a very distinguished panel here, very experienced in China. Um, and, and Kevin, um, I'd, I'd like to get you to start. How, how have the past two weeks gone? I mean, you know, how do you think that, uh, from what you've seen in the last two weeks, what does it show about where Australia-China relations are, are, um, are going to go? Well, thank you, uh, Glenda, and uh, thank you for the China Studies Centre and Professor Goodman and, and his uh, team for inviting me here today. I'm, it's a pleasure to see you all, and this is the first face-to-face -face event I've been to in two years, so it's, it's exciting and novel, and, and it's great to see you. But, Glenda, in answer to your question, I think the last two weeks have shown that we still have a challenging road ahead of us. Um, if I can digress with a, with a, a small story, um, in the 1920s, when Albert Einstein was a professor at uh, Princeton University in the United States, 
the field of quantum physics was changing at a rapid speed. Every month there were new discoveries, new theories. Every year the whole discipline was, was turned on its head. And one year, um, it was final examination time, and the dean of the school came rushing in to Einstein's office, and he said, uh, Professor, we've got a big problem. And Einstein said, well, what's the problem? He said, well, I've just seen the exam that you plan to give your students, and the questions are the same questions that you asked last year. And Einstein said, well, what's the problem? And the, uh, prof professor, uh, the dean said, well, don't you realize if everyone knows what the questions are, it's going to be a disaster. And Einstein said, yes, the questions are the same, but the answers are totally different. And for many years, the first 30 years that I worked with China, I felt like we in the West always asked the same questions. The China answers were different from uh, year to year, uh, every five years. China was changing so rapidly, it was all we could do to keep up uh, with the changes and understand. And the China questions were always, uh, will China continue to reform? Are the reforms sustainable? Will the Communist Party of China change? And things like this. But over the last 10 years, I think we've seen that the questions we ask about China are actually different. And we're now asking questions like, what are China's global aspirations? How is it managing its relations with its neighbors? Is the state more aggressive domestically, internationally? And as we grapple with these new questions and seek answers to them, we're learning about how we can best manage our own relationship uh, with China. So Glenda, as you referred to the election, I think we all uh, viewed the election as a potential tipping point where perhaps some new approaches could be um, uh, tried, uh, at, at least new in the context of what we've done over the last uh, two or three years. I see that there have been a number of very positive developments um, not only just over the last two weeks, but, but the last couple of months. And first would be China has dispatched a new ambassador to Australia. Ambassador uh, Xiao has made some very public and I think conciliatory and respectful uh, uh, comments about Australia and what he sees as uh, his hopes uh, for the future of the bilateral relationship. And the, the change in that tone, I think, is very significant. On the positive side, uh, Premier Li sent a congratulatory message to um, Prime Minister Albanese, and, and that was positive as well. Prime Minister Albanese, while he was in uh, Japan for the, uh, for the Quad, said, he's not going to use the China issue for domestic political purposes. And I thought that was a very important statement because that, in my view, hasn't been the case over the last three years. So for the Prime Minister to say, we're not going to politicize this relationship, I thought was a very positive comment. And then finally, um, as Glenda said, Foreign Minister Wong has been in the Pacific uh, on two trips. Last night I saw her interviewed, and uh, Lee Sales asked a very pointed question about China's activities uh, in the Pacific. And I thought uh, Foreign Minister uh, Wong handled it beautifully. She said, I'm here to focus on what we're doing not on what China is doing. And I thought that was a very constructive, a very positive uh, message. On the not so positive side, while he was in Japan, Prime Minister Albanese said, uh, China has changed, we haven't. Not only do I think that's not correct, in fact, Australia has changed a lot over the last uh, three to five years, but I think it, f it, it feeds into this narrative that we've heard uh, from our political leaders over the last several years that all of this discord in the bilateral relationship is China's problem. They caused it, we didn't. And that unilateral view um, I think is incorrect. And so I was a little bit disappointed when I heard the Prime Minister state that. I realized that he can't perhaps jump in to the reconciliation process immediately, but 
let's see what happens. Um, and then finally, the, the Prime Minister said that China would need to drop its trade penalties uh, against Australia as a precondition to further political engagement. And as one who's negotiated in China for many years, you don't put pre preconditions on discussions. You have discussions, you, you hear each other out, and then you start to, to sort uh, solutions, find common ground, and, and build some consensus. So I thought that those two statements from the Prime Minister were uh, a little bit um, uh, disappointing. There are plenty of positive elements, I think, moving forward. And um, uh, Louise Edwards, who is here today, uh, co-authored an, uh, an article with Colin Heseltine a couple of days ago that had some wonderful pieces of advice uh, in them. Uh, let's reinvigorate DFAT and put it at the central um, uh, place in our interaction, diplomatic interaction with China. Let's stop the public demonizing of China and revert to quiet diplomacy uh, again. Every time we make public inflammatory comments about China, I know how China is going to respond. You know how China is going to respond. And there's, there's just no constructive place for that kind of uh, baiting. We need to build our China capabilities. Centers like the China Studies Center and similar um, uh, endeavors across uh, uh, Australia need to be bolstered, and we need to increase the number of our own citizens who have a China knowledge capability. Finally, and this may be a little bit controversial for some, um, I think we need a more independent foreign policy. Uh, for the last few years, I felt like we've been fawning a bit too much over the United States and falling in line, I thought, publicly uh, behind a Washington, D.C. view of the world. We don't need to do that. The United States is going to be our friend, even if we disagree on some key issues. And it's in Australia's interest that we maintain uh, a, a, and rediscover an independent foreign policy. So I've gone on enough. Thank you, Glenda, for that. On the question of questions, we will have in probably about half an hour, I'll open the floor up for some for some questions so you can have a chance to think um, sum up for our panelists. Now, Jocelyn, Jocelyn is, um, you've had two stints in Beijing and one in Hong Kong, um, so you've got a very experienced foreign, um, foreign affairs background and also you signed this open letter a couple of, or uh, well, two weeks ago to try and um, uh, to, to call for a more constructive foreign policy. So what's your, what's your take on where we are now and um, given particularly your unique foreign affairs background? Thank you, Glenda, and, and thank you everyone for coming along this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be back on campus again. Um, so long since I was here, I got a bit lost on the, on the way. <laughs> uh, it's good to find so, that many familiar faces here also. Now, my experience, as you said, goes back a long way. I've been engaged in Australia-China relations and more broadly Australia-Asian relations. And uh, I, we have all benefited, all Australia has benefited from that long period. It was a period which we might call globalization uh, with um, reform, economic reforms in the 1980s, floating the dollar and so on. It helped us uh, to maintain a standard of living. Um, you could buy very cheap things in, in the supermarket, all made in China. Of course, it also, one of the side effects was that it, uh, it kept wages down in Australia, so I'm not sure whether overall it was uh, where the balance lies, but on the on it generally very positive. But what I have seen over the the last two three years has been a growing trend against globalisation. So I'd like just like to mention that because I think our problems with China are not just with arising from China or arising from Australia. It's a question of kind of mindset of how we see our place in the world. What we've seen is that we've put the barriers up, uh, we've imposed 
trade sanctions far more than we used to do. Um, we have um, put limits on the number of people coming in. You know, we will decide who comes and, and the circumstances under which they come. And um, we've, in a way, gone back to that island nation mentality, which was what really irked me when I was an undergraduate and led me to take up the study of China. Um, you know, the, everybody should speak English. What's happened to our teaching of Asian languages at school and in university? Um, it's like, we know what's best and we'll rule the world relying on you know, British imperial traditions. That's not the sort of country that I want to live in. And, and our relations with China are a very important part of the change that needs to be made. To some extent, I agree with, with, with Kevin that the changes that we have followed have been where we have followed along from the United States because the Trump administration also imposed trade tariffs in sparking inflation there. COVID closed borders. Europe has imposed economic sanctions, especially after Russia invaded U Ukraine. And China's been generally regarded as being a global competitor, not a trade partner, which is how we used to see it. So we start to think of ourselves how we could be self-sufficient, how we could be more autonomous, how we can reduce our dependency. I don't think this is a dead end sort of mindset. Um, and that's why I signed the letter. So the starting point, if we're going to do something about China, is a fundamental shift in mindset, I think. We are an island continent, but that doesn't mean we can cut ourselves off from the rest of the world. We, we are intimately connected with our regional neighbors. That's why it's so encouraging to see our new foreign minister visiting Pacific Islands. We ha also have, besides trade ties, we have ties with the rest of the world in terms of our history and our culture and the economy. And we need to look after those relationships, to value them. Of course, there has been a lot of talk about, you know, we have a Pacific family but I don't know about your families, but there are, are family rules about how to, to get on with each other and also how to get on with guests. And one of my family rules was when people came to um, lunch or to tea was called FHB. Are you, are you familiar with FHB? Stands for Family Hold Back. If there's not enough to go round, FHB, you let the guests take what they want first. What I mean by this FHB mentality, which I think we need with our uh, partnership with other countries, is that we don't dictate to them what they should be doing, but we share with them whatever little we have. We share their pain and we share their sorrow and we share with their achievements. And so it should be, I think, with China. Of course, we have problems. Some of our, our neighbors are not ours by choice, but they're there still, and we have to get on with them. And the way to get on with difficult neighbors is not to pick a fight. If you've got a problem, then it's best to take it to a, a non-confrontational international forum. If you've got something positive to say, then let's say it directly and face to face. So no, let's sort out the issues and decide which issues we need to, to discuss directly with China and which we can, we can put on the agenda of international bodies. Thanks, uh, Jocelyn. And, and I think when we talk about the shift in mindset, this is um, 50 years since Australia, um, well, Canberra, Beijing, um, 
uh, signed their signed their relationship under Gough Whitlam, and it is interesting how our political leaders do set that mindset. Um, <laughs> whether you talk about Hawke or Keating, um, uh, and and Howard maintained, uh, and uh, ASEAN, APAC, all these uh, were um, Australian leaders were pushing these uh, these issues, and yet um, certainly under the Morrison government was a very different attitude. So the political leaders make a difference, but obviously ordinary people and business leaders make make a big difference. And James, um, you are very right at the thick of Australia-China relations. You run Australia-China Relations Institute. Um, what's your view on 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 uh, where we are and what you know? We're going to have a reset. I mean, your initial um, thing on the conversation seemed quite optimistic, but. Um, let's hear your view. <laughs> sure. Thanks very much, Glenda, and thanks um, David Goodman and the China Studies Centre for inviting me, and thanks everyone for coming. Um, Glenda, you invited each of us to make some initial remarks about the future trajectory of the Australia-China relationship. Well, look, let me start with the obvious one. Of course, of course, much depends on how China acts, right? We all know that. No one's arguing about that. It was Beijing that put the trade uh, put the trade disruption measures in place back in May 2020, right? So, of course, it's not all just about Australia. And if Beijing's not willing to come to the party, well, the trajectory is going to look pretty grim, right? That's one point. But the problem with our discussion in Australia is that it often just stops there. In fact, that line, Kevin, that you mentioned, China has changed, of course it's true. But it has got to the stage in Australia where it has now been weaponised to deflect any agency or responsibility from Australia. Now, I'm happy to call China out, and I have, on things like cutting off political dialogue, on hitting our farmers and our miners, threatening our universities. Happy to do that. But don't tell me, as an academic, I just couldn't live with myself if I pretended, spun the narrative, which is what's happening in Australia today, that Australia hasn't changed too. Or that in the face of a changed China, we should just respond however the hell we like. <laughs> right? And that's what I think a lot of people say. It's, it's all about China. It's not about us. right? So, so don't look... Don't think about any responsibility we hold. We don't even have to think about how we respond because it's China that's changed. The conversation's not about us. And I just think that is a fundamentally dishonest um, and it's certainly an unhelpful narrative for Australia's national interest. I mean, let's not talk about, let's not talk about China. Let's talk about Australia. And a great example of this, in fact, I'm not sure... If anyone read the opinion pages of The Australian today, you will see a classic example of this exercise in distraction, right? It's not honest, um, certainly it's not academically rigorous, and I don't think it serves Australia's national interest. Now, now I've said some bad things about what Beijing did back in 2020. Let me tell you a few ways Australia has changed. We have changed, folks. I've mapped this with a lot of detail. There's two things that even back in 2019 the Morrison government did that it stopped doing in 2020, right? The first was that into Morrison's term, first year of Morrison's term, this is not so long ago, he would explicitly couch the differences with China in the context of a broader partnership. Right? So he would say, yes, we have differences with China, we'll protect Australia's national interests, but we manage those differences in the context of a partnership that we want to keep going. Right? 2020, that stopped. On the record. Second point, he deliberately put distance between himself, his own government's position, and that of the Trump administration in Washington. Right? Now, no one is talking, when Kevin says to have an independent foreign policy, a bit more independent foreign policy, he's not talking about walking away from the US alliance. Right? Of course he's not. No one is. Right? But what Morrison did was made it clear that someone was watching the Chinese embassy in Beijing or the foreign, sorry, the Chinese embassy in Canberra or the foreign ministry in Beijing, it would have been obvious that Canberra's position on China was not the same as the, Morris, uh, was not the, same as the Trump position in Washington. Again, that has changed, right? So Australia has changed. I'll finish off with these remarks, Glenda, um, and this is why I think we might have some hope, not for a reset. Can I just rule that out straight away? 
but for an improved trajectory, which really shouldn't be hard, given that we're coming from a really low base. <laughs> you know, and this is what these folks who talk about China changing just can't quite bring themselves to admit. They can never do it. That Australia is an outlier in our region, right? There's plenty of countries in the, our region that have problems with China. And in fact, they are far more serious than Australia has with China. India, 20 Indian soldiers died in a border dispute with China just last year, right? So don't give me this line, this line, oh, lots of countries have problems with China. Yes, that's my point too. Lots of countries do have problems with China, but none of them have found themselves in the situation that we are. Doesn't that kind of hint that, yeah, China may have changed, but maybe, maybe we could have handled things a bit differently as well? I mean, it's pretty bleedingly obvious to me that that's the case. So the first thing I think we're going to see, Glenna, is, Glenna, is a restoration of diplomacy in Canberra. Don't forget how bad this got, folks. In March, an airliner crashed in southern China, killing 132 people. Did you see the statement from our Prime Minister or Foreign Minister? No, you didn't, because we didn't make one, right? Even in that, you know, could, could you think of a more simple development where we could have put out a conciliatory remarks? No, we didn't. India did, UK did, Canada did, New Zealand did, we didn't, right? So we're going to have a, a government that treats diplomacy seriously again. We're going to have a Foreign Minister who puts DFAT back in char charge of running the China relationship. That doesn't mean she's going to be a soft touch. But what it does mean is you're not going to have a defence minister cut, running in from the sidelines, inserting hysterical random commentary on Australia's relationship with China. Mm -hmm. Penny Wong will run the portfolio. That's a good thing. And finally, I think this election presents an opportunity for both sides to undertake a, a face-saving step back. Uh, you know, Beijing's got to understand that Canberra's got a domestic political cha challenge in managing a changed China relationship. And I just hope there are enough cool heads in Canberra to recognise that Beijing too has a domestic political challenge that it has to manage to chart a different course in the relationship. I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, James. Um, just while we're on the, on the subject of the election, um, I do want to raise, and it was raised, about um, the role of, of Chinese voters in, in Australia. Um, I think 6% of the Australian population is either born in China or dates its roots back to uh, Chinese origins. Um, I wonder, did, how did the Morrison governments, uh, I'll start with you, Kevin, how did the Morrison governments um, anti-China rhetoric, did, did that play out in the Australian electorate in, in ways perhaps that Morrison might not have expected? I mean, did, did this affect the way uh, Australians uh, voted? Uh, th thanks, Glenda. I, I, I can answer that in two ways. One is uh, anecdotally. And uh, in my organization, I'm the only um, non-Chinese born person. And my friends and colleagues have said to me repeatedly over the last 18 months that they feel personally threatened and offended by the anti-China rhetoric. Now these are not people who are big Communist Party of, of China supporters, um, but what they're doing is they're reflecting the fact that the rhetoric has gotten so out of control that they personally felt that uh, ill at ease. And m many of these people have been traditional uh, liberal voters. Um, after the election, some of you may have seen some of the uh, election wrap up, and the analysis um, that I saw earlier this week was that um, in 2019, whenever the last election was, um, something like uh, 60 to 70 percent of Australian Chinese voters voted for the coalition. This time around, it was 60 to 70 percent voted for Labor. And I think that says a lot. Um, and um, hopefully our politicians have taken that on board. Jocelyn, do you have any thoughts about that? And, and also the broader issue of these, you know, foreign interference laws and how that is playing out in how in academia. I mean, is it, yeah. is it causing genuine academic cooperation to to um, to be threatened or to be under under pressure. I mean, there's there's a lot of sort of subterranean um, things that have been happening that perhaps people don't want to talk about publicly, but they certainly they're certainly feeling them. Yes. Well, uh, as starting with the election, um, 
I live in the uh, North Sydney electorate, and uh, that's now one of the Teal representatives. Uh, and in fact, I worked with Kylie Tink because in that electorate, it's not been listed amongst those with the highest proportion of Chinese voters. But it's quite a significant amount. In Willoughby, um, local government area, the, according to their own figures, there's something like 25% of the uh, electorate or the population is ethnic Chinese. Of course, they're not all voters, um, but that just gives you an indication. So I think, going back to what I said about you know, our mindset, one of the things that our politicians haven't caught up with is that our society has changed. And it was very encouraging, um, I think um, Albanese used the word multicultural which I haven't heard for, <laughs> <laughs> for, for, for quite a few years. But it's a good indication that um, the, the government will pay more respect to the ethnic population in, Aus in Australia. Now, maybe they were liberal voters who switched, but I think there's a much more fundamental issue than that because both in the community and, I think, in universities. Um, I've been a little bit out of it, and other people may have, some of you people in the audience may have more to contribute on that. It's very hard to be accepted as an objective commentator these days. In what I write, uh, have published, or what, in what I saw, I advised Kylie Tink to speak about, you get attacked from both sides. You get attacked by the 300 percenters, you know, um, and you also get attacked by the Taiwan independence and the Hong Kong student demonstration supporters. You can't please everyone. And it, you say to yourself, well, if every, all sides are attacking me, that must move, mean that I'm, I'm right. But it's a very uncomfortable position to be in. And it has had a very bad effect on the psychology, psyche of, of particularly of Chinese Australians, I think. They don't want to be in the middle. They don't, they don't like talk of war in particular. So <laughs> let's tone the rhetoric down. And, and let's accept that, you know, commentators, academics, business people can be aware of the difficulties and the problems on both sides, can sympathize with the aspirations of Hong Kong demonstrators, and also sympathize with the, the, um, those people who, who lost relatives and friends in the Tiananmen. We mark the anniversary tomorrow. But you, <laughs> you've still got to speak to, to look for truth, to try and to use my old professor's um, adage, he said, uh, seeking truth with love, I think is a good motto to have. Thank you. Thank you. And James, what would, would you want to come in on this issue of the election and perhaps these broader issues of anti-Chinese um, rhetoric that we've had from the top of our government? Yeah, look, I think Jocelyn is the best person to comment on that, and I think she has. <laughs> um, I might just make one comment yeah, sure. on academia, if that's okay. I mean, that's, that's yeah. where I spend my days. Um, yeah, the attacks on academics over the last two years who haven't towed the Canberra line has just been absolutely extraordinary, you know, extraordinary. I'm not quite sure what sets these people off. Is it because academics have some expertise that they find threatening? Or is it because they have independence that they cannot control? Maybe that feeds into their historical reaction. But let me just quote from you a sentence. This is from a commentary piece in today's Australian newspaper, right? Referring to the open letter that 15 academics signed, including Jocelyn and myself. Interestingly, the commentator doesn't disagree with anything we said. He can't point anything factually wrong, 
with what the open letter included, but this is what he did say. Quote, their letter was published concurrently in English by the Xinhua News Agency, the primary press organ of the Chinese Communist Party. These are academics, it seems, who have better access to Beijing than ministers in the outgoing federal government. Right? You're all clear? You're all clear on what the message is? Right? No, Jocelyn, no, Jocelyn, myself, are agents of the Chinese Communist Party. <laughs> David Goodman, who organised the letter, worked it so Xinhua would concurrently publish the letter at the same time as the letter was published on an Australian website. Lies, right? But it, it's, not, it, it's just a straight out lie. A misrepresentation, mis, calling it a misrepresentation is too generous, right? But here we are, folks. Well, I can only speak for myself, and um, thank God <laughs> UTS supports academic freedom. Um, I don't have to worry about my job, and I do actually care about the, uh, the rigour of the work I do, um, so I'm just going to keep talking as I have been. Okay, and while, um, yeah, I mean, all, all of us who do write about China, we're um, constantly, uh, if you look at the comments underneath us, um, uh, a very, uh, can be very nasty, um, and I think that defers that um, deters a lot of people from engaging as much as they, as they would like to. Um, and um, and I, I'm just going to shift the subject now. I'll keep with you, James. Um, I will look at a number of threads in the relationship, but one is business. Yep. And interestingly enough, because that's sort of the area I've been involved in, it took lots and lots of business people. And um, a lot of those very actively do business with China. There's a very natural complementarity, and this is the difference between America. We don't compete with China. We actually have things that China wants. China has things that we want, and it actually works quite well, um, which is why we have a trade surplus and, and other countries don't. Um, and a lot of people in business uh, want a much better relationship with China and they have been afraid to, um, to speak out. And it was interesting that Dutton, when he was elected as head of the Liberal Party, was attacking business. So uh, uh, the Liberal Party and business are a little bit um, out of tune. But um, there is this thing, even business leaders have been afraid to, uh, to make comments about China, even to say, let's... Uh, let's improve things. Let's see if we can tone down the rhetoric. But, but James, on this Australia-China business relationship, the interesting thing is despite all mm. these declining political relationships, the fundamentally people um, on both sides seem to want to do business with each other um, despite all sorts of other um, political pressures. So, I mean, what are you seeing? And then I'll come to you, uh, Kevin. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we need to be careful in not exaggerating the extent to which geopolitical differences spill over to hurt economic links. I mean, just the fact is, again, sorry to keep coming back to facts, I know it's not a popular thing to do in the Australia-China discussion, but last year, two-way trade between Australia and China hit a record high. Now, I'm not saying everything was rosy, partly that was a good part of it actually was to do with um, extremely high iron ore prices, but the, trend, the disruption affecting wine, cotton, barley and so on, that's all real, I'm not denying it, uh, but two-way trade still remains at a record high. There's fundamental reasons for that, the ones you mentioned, the, those complementarities and other economic basics like purchasing power. I mean, China has, is the country that has the purchasing power to pay for Australian goods and services, so not surprisingly, our businesses are keen on sending it there. And the other thing, Glenda, I sometimes see our business community, again, misrepresented, it's, it's pretty disgraceful stuff, as though if a company has an exposure to China, then somehow they are compromised or opening Australia up to risk. Well, no. I mean, this, this line where you have an exposure to China and that leads one-to-one -to, -one to risk is just really... I mean, that's like two-year-old analysis. Take our cotton growers, right? Back in 2020, they had three-quarters of their output exports going to China. Three-quarters, right? Big exposure, right? So people say, well, they're either stupid, right? <laughs> they don't understand China or they're not taking the risk seriously. Well, guess what? Beijing closed the door, right? So, the, the scenario that they were warned about unfolded. What happened? Overnight, redirected their output to other markets. They suffered virtually no losses at all. Why is that? Because cotton growers understood full well that their product is traded in competitive global markets. And it turns out they knew 
competitive global markets are actually a really, really effective risk mitigation mechanism. Now, unfortunately, some of our security folks in Canberra don't actually understand global markets. It's business folks who actually understand those mitigation mechanisms far better than many of our commentators do. So let's treat economic risks from exposure to China seriously, but gosh, we've got to do better than this um, conversation we've been having so far. And it's interesting with the company Penfolds, which is owned by Treasury Wine Estate. Uh, Penfolds, uh, well, Treasury Wine Estate before the tariffs was the biggest single um, foreign supplier of, of uh, well, sorry, Australia was the biggest single supplier of foreign wine in China. Um, the growing Chinese middle class uh, loved Australian wine and they loved the Penfolds brand. And it's interesting that Treasury Wine Estate is still very committed to China and they are now making Penfolds in, um, in Napa Valley and also in Europe and exporting it into China. The head of Penfolds, which is a huge global brand, is still based in Shanghai. So that company is still very much committed to the China market and I think you know, they're hoping maybe things um, might improve, but they're, they're looking at other ways to engage with, with China. Um, now, Kevin, what are you seeing on the business? Because business and trade is a very important part of the relationship, and it, it, it's very real, and as I've said, the complementarity is there, but what are you seeing as a view in the business community? And is this a, a, a grounds for hope, or um, is it going to be complicated? <laughs> Well, thank you, Glenda, and, and I agree with everything that James said. I think that, in short, uh, the route for business continues to be very optimistic and, and positive. Uh, one of the things that has notably been absent in the so-called security discussion over the last three years vis-a-vis uh, -vis China is that um, economics are also part of our security, and uh, we have become very wealthy uh, as a country, uh, we've, be, we've developed world-class industries often on the back of our trade and investment relationship with China. This has been a significant factor in uh, the creation of our own economic security. And this one-dimensional view that I've seen from Canberra over the last few years seems to take that for granted or ignore it, one or the other. As a business person, I've always said that when the bilateral relationship is good, conducting business with China is like doing work in the sunshine. Everyone's happy, everyone's willing to talk about their activities, um, uh, share experiences, build the common knowledge and, and prosperity. When the bilateral relationship is bad, it's like doing business in the shadows. And I think we've seen, uh, and my contemporaries in the business community, even if they've had large operations in China, very significant investments in China, they don't talk about it. Because as James said before, if you become associated with China, somehow there's been this taint, this question about um, uh, whether that's the right thing, whose side are you on? And so business leaders individually have been pretty much reluctant uh, to talk about their activities. You've had very capable uh, and vocal spokespeople like David Olson from the Australia China Business Council and Warwick Smith from the uh, Business Council of Australia who have tried to bring the discussion back into some uh, more balanced uh, place. Um, and, and those people will continue uh, that process. It's probably one of the reasons why we haven't suffered more than we have over uh, the last two or three years. One area that we have suffered, and it may take a long time to recover, is Chinese investment in Australia has just dropped off a cliff. And so they went from being one of our largest, if not the largest, uh, foreign investor in Australia in just a few short years to, to virtually investing nothing, and there's no trajectory upward uh, in that. Um, as I traveled around China after the uh, uh, Chinalco Rio Tento debacle in 2009, even five years later, as I met with Chinese business people, they'd say, ah, Australia doesn't want Chinese investment. And based on that one episode, there was this image created in China that, that Australia was not welcome, and it took many, many years for that attitude, that perception uh, to be changed. I'm afraid it's going to take many years for us to recover 
from this downturn. Um, and we will suffer. We're a country built on foreign investment. We don't have the capital ourselves to uh, develop our industries the way we need to. Uh, and as you said, uh, China's a, a, a good partner uh, in, in our complementary needs. Mm -hmm. Jocelyn, I, I know you're not a business expert, but you're a foreign affairs expert. I just, um, I just want to change the subject a little bit. Um, what does it mean? Well, people have talked about under the Morrison government that foreign affairs was, uh, their role was reduced, um, their voice was um, diminished. Um, do you feel, and what does that, how does that affect the government policy? Do you feel that foreign affairs under Penny Wong will play a, in terms of the actual, actual diplomats, will play more of a role? And just on the other side, what role, when we've seen this new Chinese ambassador, Mr. Xiao, very experienced, he's come from um, Indonesia, he's come with some different rhetoric, but what difference can, can he make as well? Yeah. <clears throat> well, Let's start with, with the new ambassador. I think that is, um, you could say that uh, what he has said is nothing really out of the ordinary. You would expect um, that he would uh, make a, 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 a statement to the press, particularly when the press is so interested in, in our relations with China. But it's the tone, I think, of, of his way of speaking that we should note. And uh, I really th think w was very much struck by, by Morrison not seeing him. I mean, that's a standard courtesy for the appointment of a new ambassador, that he would make high-level calls. Um, it was a deliberate snub to him. Uh, so it was quite clear that the China relations were being weaponized by the previous government. Let us hope that the new government is able to deal with the relations in a more rational way. I also know that you know, uh, Chinese government sets a great store on anniversaries. Um, we had in the past big uh, celebrations observing the 20th anniversary, the 30th anniversary, and now 40th anniversary, now we're coming up to 50th anniversary of, of relations. And <clears throat> the Ministry of, of Foreign Affairs, I think one of their roles is to make sure that these anniversaries are observed. Um, within the Chinese government, of course, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs is not a, the most powerful ministry. So um, you can, we shouldn't take necessarily this request, you know, that we resolve all the issues and start planning a, a big celebration in December as being a statement from the highest level of Chinese government. But it's certainly the objective of the ministry and of the embassy and the consulate here. Uh, and it provides an opportunity for us to respond in a measured way, and hopefully to, um, uh, some, you said you don't like the word reset, but, <laughs> but recalibrate, perhaps, our, our relationship. Um, and also, it also provides an opportunity to look back on what we have achieved over 50 years, because we've really come a very long way. See, <clears throat> just reminiscing, I was in Beijing um, on the day that the establishment of diplomatic relations was announced. I was there with a delegation from this university, the University wow. of Sydney. We sent a cable from the Peking Hotel to the new Prime Minister, Gough Whitlam, congratulating him and signed it, the Australians in China. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so, in a, we, it was a very difficult time to be there. It was the end of the Cultural Revolution. Our contacts with um, academics and, and, uh, were, were very, very limited. There were parties, representatives in on every conversation we had. There was absolutely no conversation was permitted with any ordinary 
members of the community, people on the street, not allowed to communicate with foreigners. But still we managed to do it, even in that Cold War period. So surely we can do it again <laughs> 50 years later. James, you, you're, you've got, I think, next week or the week after, you're hosting the Chinese ambassador at, at, at Acre, and you've, you've met him. Um, you know, on his side, is that, does, can that make a difference? I think in the new Chinese ambassador, you have, as Justin said, an experienced diplomat who is doing all that he can. Um, you know, I know there's a lot of quick commentary in Australia to say, well, you know, if, if he was serious, why hasn't he told back Beijing to roll back <laughs> the trade punishments, let the Australians detained in China, Chung Lei, Yong Heng Jun, um, let them go free? Well, I, I, you know, that would be good, but I, I'm not sure that's actually in the ambassador's um, capacity to be able to pull that one off. But look, here's what he said just yesterday, Glenn, and I quote again, I'm ready to quote, I'm ready to compare notes and see what we can do together, close quote. So I think the way this is going to start, it's going to be modest, and what you'll have is a frank discussion between the new Chinese ambassador and the foreign minister, Penny Wong, um, and then we're going to build from that. Don't forget that Political trust on both sides has just been absolutely shattered over the last few years, right? So both sides um, are, are petrified of being, of, of, of unilaterally making a concession that the other side then uses to, um, you know, to, to weaponise and bolt them back, right? So it's going to be modest, but I think that initial conversations between Penny Wong and the ambassador, um, you've got a starting point, and from there, I think you'll see both sides doing, in, you know, subtle diplomatic signalling, um, and then we chart a gradual trajectory forward. Uh, but, you know, we're not going back to 2015. Mm -hmm. Thank you, James. And thanks very much to the um, China Studies Centre for hosting this, and thank you very much.